It's through each other we see Jesus clearly. I love relationship. I love community. I love people. But y'all, people have got to yield to our relationship to God. Jesus has to come first. Y'all, we've got to remember that our Jesus was not exactly a social butterfly. If you study the life of Christ, especially the three years of his earthly ministry, he spent much more time as an outsider than he did as an insider. He loved people, obviously. He loved people perfectly, but he did not court public favor. Turn to Luke chapter four, incredible passage. One of my favorite stories in Luke's gospel, and Luke's gospel itself is a unique kind of an outsider jutting out kind of book because Luke is the only author of Holy Writ who was Gentile. He was other. He wasn't Jewish. We've got a couple of books who are formally classified as anonymous, but the only known Gentile author of Scripture is Dr. Luke. So he gives you this kind of jutting out perspective. I love his gospel, his euangelion, his good news. Luke chapter four, verse 16, and he, Dr. Luke's talking about Jesus here, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, as was his custom. He went to synagogue on Sabbath day or Shabbat, if y'all come from a Jewish background, and he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him and he began to say to them, today, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joe's son? Is this not Mary and Joe's boy? Yeah. I mean, my kid played t-ball with him. <laughs> I mean, I remember Jesus. He was in the school play. He was a good kid. You know, my daughter-in-law told me that he's been on some kind of a mission trip and she said he did a miracle or two. And I'm not sure about it, but obviously while he's been on the road, he has been to like some Zig Ziglar course on teaching because he is <laughs> such an interesting communicator. I mean, usually when Rabbi gets to talking, I just start playing Angry Birds, but this Jesus, <laughs> he is just really turned into quite the communicator. I mean, they're just, they're all like, we're so proud, local boy does good, he's come home. Y'all know that it was a huge deal he read from the prophet Isaiah too, right? You know that in Jewish culture, first century, they had what was called a Torah closet at the back of the church. And what would happen is somebody, not Jesus, is one of the juniors would go back to the closet, grab a scroll and bring it forward. And in synagogues like Jesus Synagogue, because Naz Nazareth is a two bit dinky little town, about 300 people. So this isn't a big church. They don't have a paid rabbi. Guys would take turns every week reading from whatever was pulled out of the Torah closet and then they would share. And some of them, as you can imagine, were boring as watching paint dry and some of them were a little better. But they, they didn't have professional rabbis. They just have men in the community who would read from one of the scrolls brought from the Torah closet, and then they would share their thoughts on it, kind of a devotional, if you will. So it's an honor when Jesus comes back in town, this local kid who'd left, he sits up front in what was called Moses' seat, that's a seat of honor, where you'd sit when you're reading from Torah, and some junior kid, almost like an acolyte in the Catholic church, goes, grabs the scroll, scroll, brings it to Jesus. Just so happens to be the scroll of Isaiah. Just so happens. People tell me the Bible's boring. I'm like, no, you're boring, you stupid person. <laughs> this is the most incredible book. I mean, it's a love story, it's amazing, it's filled with me. It's unbelievable, y'all. Jesus is in his hometown synagogue. And the scroll they bring him by chance on that day when he just so happened to be home is the servant songs from Isaiah saying, the Savior has come. 
And when the Savior comes, blind people will see and paralyzed people will do cartwheels. He reads that and this yahoo little local audience goes, isn't he a nice boy? Now y'all, he could have sat there and let me tell you, did I tell you I'm a three on the Enneagram? Ooh, I love when people like me. When I get hateful things on Instagram, it hurts my feelings. You know, your daughter's hair is trashy. I'm like, well, your daughter's fat. I mean, it's just amazing. And I don't, I don't say it. I don't say it, I promise you. But you know, you just, it kind of hurts your feelings. And so if I'm in my hometown synagogue and everybody went, hasn't Lisa become such a good teacher? I'd be like, amen. Like, I'd be like, let's all hug and leave because I'm, I'm going out on top here. You know, everybody's leaning in. Everybody's like me, not Jesus. Because Jesus came to do his Father's will, not to court public favor, even at home. Even at home. Y'all, it's one thing to be willing to stand out when you're with people you don't know, but to be at home when you're at Bethel and you're leading and some people keep their arms crossed during the song, kills you a little bit, doesn't it? I mean, because those are your people. Those are your people. So it make perfect sense if Jesus stopped right there because it says, and all the people thought well of him, but not Jesus, because everything he was doing was to please the Father, not to please us. So even though he's right at the point of being endeared forever to this home crowd, he does the Father's business. He pokes out. He says, I know that's like the least holy image ever. I need y'all to get past, get past the cones. He is set apart. He says, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician heal yourself. We have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown, but in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land and Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow and there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha and none of them was cleansed but only Naaman, the Syrian. Do you know what he's saying to them? Y'all have missed the boat. You have missed the boat. You're all kiki, do you love me? And you've missed the whole point. Kiki doesn't care about you. You've missed the whole point. The whole point is God the Father in glory who sent me to reconcile to you to him and you think I'm a good boy? I'm not talking about the Lord here. I am the Lord. I am he, I am he. And you know what the crowd does? You know what the crowd does when the local boy says, I'm it, I'm the one we've been praying for for centuries. Can you imagine how that went over? That was like being a hot dog vendor at a vegan festival. <laughs> I and mean, it was rough. After he makes that proclamation, here's what happened. When they heard these things all in the synagogue were filled with wrath and they rose up and they drove him out of town and they brought him to the brow of a hill in which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff but passing through their midst because it wasn't his time yet Jesus escaped you know it's one thing when strangers on Instagram conspire to say cruel or less than kind things about you it's a whole nother thing when your friends are doing the cutting. It's a whole nother thing when Jesus' first cousins conspired to kill him because what he said didn't fit and what he did was unpopular. It made them feel awkward. Y'all, we are supposed to emulate Jesus. We are supposed to love the people around us well. I'm, please hear me. I'm not for a moment saying that relationships aren't a gift from God. I'm not for a moment saying community isn't sacred. One of my favorite quotes comes from a guy named Leslie Newbigin. 
And he says, community is the most effective hermeneutic of the gospel. In other words, it's through each other we see Jesus clearly. I love relationship. I love community. I love people. But y'all, people have got to yield to our relationship to God. Jesus has to come first. We're going to spend the rest of this day talking about what it looks like to be women who are so in love with Jesus that we actually transform culture. Martin Luther King said, church used to be a thermostat. Gatherings of Christ's followers used to be a thermostat. We used to literally change the temperature of culture. Jen would use the word atmosphere. Atmospheres change when Christ followers walk into that room, to that area. But Dr. King said, now church has become a thermometer. We simply take the temperature of culture, and then usually align our lives according to that. Y'all, that's not how it's supposed to be. We are aliens, we are strangers, we are peculiar people. We're supposed to poke out much. We're supposed to be different. There are parties I want people to not invite me to. There are people that I want to quit using the language they're using when I come walking up, and I'm fine with it being uncomfortable. I'm 55 years old, I could care less if it's a little awkward. I love the statement, I'm, I'm too young to quit and I'm too old to be bullied. <laughs> it's like, you know what? I'm just gonna do Jesus. And if that steps on a few toes, that's fine. As long as I've hugged him to my bosom and been authentic, that's fine if it steps on a few toes. We're gonna spend the rest of our time together really talking about what it looks like to be women who affect culture and women who lead well because of our love of Christ. I wanna make a pact with y'all. There's three things I want us to focus on if I can be so bossy. The first is let's commit to love well, but never assume that community with others is equivalent to communion with Christ. Let's commit to hug hard, but never confuse human contact with holy intimacy. Not the same thing. Let's commit to share our hearts as freely and as authentically as we can with the people God has sovereignly aligned us to walk through life with. Let's love people really well and let's do it genuinely. But y'all, let's never forget there is a divine hole in our soul created by God himself. We are imago Dei. And the only thing that fills that relational hole for us is Jesus. It's only Jesus. I want to leave you with just one question, but it's a question I've been sitting in for the last couple of months, and so I felt led to share it with y'all. Don't want you to answer it right now. I just want you to sit in this for a minute. What or who is God calling you to leave in order to lead? What or who is God calling you to leave, maybe just loosen your grip on, in order to lead in a way it turns others to